Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening if you're in uh, in the East, or good morning if you're in, in North America. Um, this is our last Center for Japanese Studies research seminar of the semester. There will be more in, um, in the new academic year, but this is our last one. And uh, this is normally a CJS research seminar, but due to COVID, this has now become or has been CJS research webinars. And today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Anthony Best, who is associate professor in the Department of International History at the London School of Economics and Political Science, which he joined in 1989. Uh, Dr. Best's main research interests lie in Anglo-Japanese relations, the origins of the Pacific War, and the international history of East Asia. He has written um, numerous publications on the history of modern Japan, intelligence, and international history. The list of those publications is too long for me to <laughs> read it out here, but I would like to highlight some of the books that he's written and co-edited and co-edited. So, um, Britain, Japan, and Pearl Harbor, Avoiding War in East Asia, or British Intelligence and the Japanese Challenge in Asia. Um, and he has edited the International History of East Asia, Imperial Japan and the World, and co-edited such volumes as On the Fringes of Diplomacy, Influences on British Foreign Policy, um, Japan and the Great War, and the list goes on. So you can, as you can see from the number of these wonderful volumes, which have served um, a lot of students over the years uh, and colleagues over the years, um, the scope of Dr. Best's research is very broad and the issues that he analyzes are of incredible importance, not just for Japanese or East Asian history, but for global history. So uh, in today's talk, as you can see on your screen, uh, Dr. Best will talk about his latest book mm -hmm. titled British Engagement with Japan, 1854-1922, The Origins and Course of an Unlikely Alliance. Um, and the, today's talk is titled Britain's Road to Unlikely Alliance with Japan. And without further ado, I want to give it to Dr. Best. One thing I would like to mention, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your screens. Um, so we will have 45 to 50 minutes of uh, talk, and then we will have a Q&A session after that. Dr. Best, floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you for everybody. Um for appearing. Um, if, if it is late at night in Japan, um, I'm even more grateful. Um, as uh, Shazan has said, um, this is uh, a talk that's linked to my new book and I'm very grateful for a chance to, to publicize it. Um, this came out at the end of last year and it's been the result of um, too many years of research and too many um, research trips. Um, what I want to do in this talk is to um, focus in on the linchpin, really, of the book, um, which is understanding um, the origins and nature of the 1902 alliance between Britain and Japan. Um, I'm sure anybody who's um, conversant with this topic um, knows that the, the standard works are those by my former PhD supervisor, Professor Ian Nish, um, who's looked at both the British and the Japanese side um, to understand the origins and, and course of the alliance. Um, and what my work is intended to do is, is by no means to disagree with Ian. Um, he's a fantastic scholar. Um, I did found very little where I would come to a different interpretation during all of the research that I did. Um, what I, I see this book doing is, is, is complementing Ian's work um, and 
commenting on it with some of the new methodologies um, that have come into the, the discipline of international history um, over the last few decades. So let me just set out what this, this orthodox image of the Alliance um, that Ian helped to construct um, consists of. Um, it's very much to do with the Alliance being created between 1900 and 1902 um, by Britain and Japan, because in realpolitik terms, they are both determined to oppose Russian ambitions in Northeast Asia, which were revealed by in, in their fullest form by the Boxer Crisis of 1900 and the claims that uh, Russia made on China in, in early 1901. Um, the alliance was an object primarily in deterrence. Um, it was hoped that the appearance of the alliance would persuade Russia to pull back, um, but it allowed for the scenario where if Russia did not retreat, then Japan would be able to go to war in defense of its own interests without the fear of Russia being backed by its European ally, France. So in essence, the alliance is creating the potential for a limited bilateral war in East Asia. Um, and I think that a lot of what we're looking at is, in terms of the orthodox history is precisely correct. What I wanted to do though in this book was to think about the alliance against a, uh, a broader background. Um, we are after all dealing with the creation of an alliance between two very different countries in terms of race, culture, and religion. What is more, we're doing this, we're looking at the development of the alliance at a moment in history where these differences perhaps matter more than ever. They're a matter of public discourse. This after all is the era of the yellow peril. And that surely then raises the question of how in an era when there is talk of the racial divide, how is it possible for Britain and Japan to reach over that divide, to, to bridge that divide um, between the two countries? So that is, um, that's essentially what the first part of the book is um, looking at. Um, the second part looks at how the alliance is maintained despite those differences for another uh, 20 or so years. So what I'm going to do now is just sketch out in brief some of the things that I say at the very start of the book before then moving on to look at the um, 1890s. So in the book, um, what I tried to do um, based on the research that I did was to describe um, what I saw from the British side, and I am talking here about the British side of the equation. Um, I'm happy to answer uh, on Japan if there are questions about it to the degree that I can. I know less about that clearly. Um, but what I see from the British side is a four step progression towards the Alliance. I firstly describe what I call a period of interest, um, interest in Japan between 1854 and 1880. I then see a gearing up of this between 1880 and 1894, a development of respect. And that is the process that ends um, with the, uh, the renegotiation of the commercial treaty um, in 1894. I then deal with really the topic for today, which is the development of uh, admiration between 1895 and 1899. And then what I see as the final stage, which is different from admiration, um, it is moving towards rather an, uh, an identity, a common identity built on a sense of trust in Japan. And that sense of trust is vital 
to the creation of an alliance. So th those are the four stages. Um, and I'll just run through fairly briefly what I mean by interest um, and respect before I get on to the 1890s. Um, now, you may well be aware and perhaps alarmed that um, in an age when um, Saidian uh, interpretations of history are so prevalent that I am talking of these terms of interest in Japan and not dismissal um, of it based on racial terms. But what I'm doing, have done in this project is very much based on primary sources. Um, I have gone back to the uh, contemporaneous literature, books, um, journals, diaries, and letters in trying to um, tell the story of Britain's relations with Japan. And from those sources, I came to the uh, following conclusions. I was very interested to see around 1858 when the first Britons um, arrived uh, in Japan in the modern era, uh, the kind of things that they were interested in. And indeed there is a, a real sense of marvel at Japan uh, at the beginning of this relationship. Um, one can see, as I say in this slide, there is some interest among some observers in the idea that there are some, some commonalities between Britain and Japan. Um, some of these fairly obviously, they may seem a little glib, um, but the idea that there are a geopo geopolitical parallels, that both are island nations, island empires, anchored off turbulent continents. So is there a sense in which they, they have a, a common understanding of their place within geopolitics? That's one uh, area of uh, interest that sparked. The other, and of course, anybody who's experienced a Japanese summer and a British summer will be rather surprised at this, but there is talk about the commonality between climate. Um, but this is, in, in a way, dealing with the Japanese climate in contradistinction to the tropical climates of, uh, semi-tropical in Hong Kong's case, but of Malaya and India, that it is easier for Europeans to get used to uh, a country such as Japan with clear differentiated seasons, um, with everything bar the height of the summer months um, being fairly comfortable. And it's worth noting that climate is talked about in the mid 19th century in terms of something that can either hasten or act as an obstacle to the development of, of civilization. And um, Japan is therefore treated differently um, because of its climatic conditions to certainly southern China and India. Linked to this is the idea that those who arrive in Japan um, write about what seems to be, yes, a, a very distinct civilization, a separate civilization, but a civilization nonetheless. And what is more, and I emphasize this a number of times in the book, a living civilization. There's a sense you get from um, British visitors to China and India that they're very impressed by the civilizational past of these countries, but they're very much seeing it in terms of the past. Um, and that these civilizations are no longer virile. Um, whereas Japan does seem to have its own distinct civilization, which is still virile, it's still living. Another thing that they're interested in, um, and I take this from the contemporaneous interest in romanticism um, in Europe, is that there is an attempt to see uh, parallels with the medieval period, um, which is being eulogized within um, the Romantic movement uh, in Europe. And they see parallels to that in Japan. And moreover, the Romantic movement has a great interest in folk tales. 
and Japan with its samurai caste, um, with uh, Shinto and uh, uh, its view of religion. It, there's lots of tales which create the idea of a rather romantic and exotic and interesting Japan. I'm sure almost everyone who's attending here will know that there is uh, great admiration and interest in the fine and applied arts of Japan during this period. So there is an, a, an interest. Now, clearly some of that is patronizing. Some of that is mere exoticism. Um, so we shouldn't uh, see this as just outright admiration um, in this period. But what I argue in the book is that at the very least, this uh, interest in Japan whether exotic or otherwise, uh, made Japan a, an attractive destination for travelers. And that this was very important because this coincided with the rise of the globetrotter phenomenon. That is the wealthy in the West um, being able, by drawing on their, their wealth, to be able to travel around the world through a mixture of um, boat steamers and uh, the new transcontinental railways. And so Japan actually benefits from that revolution in um, mass travel. Um, and at the same time, it's an attractive destination. Now, my idea then is I looked at numerous globetrotter accounts of Japan. And it is clear, as you would expect, that, that many are couched in, in the terms of exoticism alone. But it's also clear that among the people who visited and wrote on their experiences were those who were genuinely intellectually curious, and in particular, curious about Japan's attempt to modernize itself. Um, and I would include here, as I've written down, there are a number of liberal politicians who write of their experiences. Sir Charles Dilke, a very influential liberal politician of the time. Sir David uh, Vaderburn, uh, a, notice, a noted legalist as well. W.S. Kane, uh, an, um, an important social reformer. We can also see this amongst journalists. Uh, Henry Lucy was one of the most prominent parliamentary um, journalists of his time. In 1884, he took a year off to go around the world. Henry Norman was a prominent um, liberal journalist who later on became an MP. Sir Edward Arnold is best known these days as a, a rather mystical poet, um, but he began his career in journalism. Um, by the end of the 1870s, he's editor of the Daily Telegraph. He goes to Japan, is absolutely enthralled by the place. Um, and lastly, um, and we'll come back to this later on, um, there is the editor of the British medical journal, Ernest Hart, who um, goes in 1891. So there's a lot of people um, who are visiting Japan and writing about the country. And as I say in the next slide, essentially what they're doing is they are disseminating a sense of respect for the country a sense of respect for its contemporaneous achievements. I was very interested to see um, not simply um, assessments of the Japanese armed forces, which is maybe something one would expect, but I was also very interested to see in these accounts um, discussions of visits to uh, institutions undergoing modernization in terms of hospitals, prisons, um, in the case of Henry Norman observing um, a criminal trial in process. Um, and as I say, these descriptions of Japan and the achievements that it's uh, undertaking are being disseminated reasonably widely um, within Britain. The other group that's uh, disseminating respect is the Oyatoi um, Gaikokujin, um, the foreign, the British foreign workers employed by uh, largely the Japanese government. They're in large numbers in the 1870s. 
numbers slightly declining in the 1880s. Um, a number of the um, Oyatoi are young scientists. They are people who will go on to have prominent careers in Britain, either as scientists or as educationalists. Um, and these groups too are writing positively um, in the main about their experience in Japan with particular focus on Japan's advances in education, science um, and technology. Um, and these, uh, the observations by these groups are getting into um, publications such as Nature, which already is an uh, extremely important uh, publication in the field of science. Um, and another sign of the times is that uh, a number of these globetrotters and uh, returned Oyatoi in 1891 are uh, involved in the establishment of the Japan Society of London, which of course then begins to hold its own talks, um, emphasizing uh, aspects of uh, the Japanese past, but also of Japan's modernity. The argument I make in the book um, is that this observation of Japan and the advances that it's making um, across the board of uh, government activity um, and in education, science and technology, um, but particularly in the law, are enough to lead to the first really important turning point in Anglo-Japanese relations, which was in July 1894, um, the signing of a new Anglo-Japanese commercial treaty. Um, and part of that commercial treaty, of course, is giving up the right uh, for Britons to exercise extraterritoriality in Japan. So with the uh, coming uh, into play of this agreement in 1899, you then get Britons being subject to Japanese law. Now, Britain would not do that if it did not have um, a degree of respect and, and even trust in the Japanese legal system. And it's worth noting here, one should contrast this with the experience of other countries where extraterritoriality is in play, um, essentially with Iran and Thailand, extraterritoriality is waved away in the 1920s. It won't be waved away with China until 1943. So Japan is well in advance of those working under similar conditions. The other thing that's worth noting, however, that is leading to the commercial treaty is exactly this emphasis on commerce. Britain wants to take advantage of the Japanese market. It's interested in particular in Japanese spending on infrastructure and armaments, and it wants to increase Japan's interest in Britain by making concessions in the commercial treaty. So that gets us up to 1894 and the Anglo-Japanese commercial treaty. Um, up until this point, it should be said that even within the orthodox literature, there's very little talk up to 1894 about um, the prospects of an Anglo-Japanese alliance. Um, there's occasionally rather naive comments I read in um, Japanese texts, some English texts about, you know, the idea that Britain and Japan are friends from the very beginning. I think we can, we can discount that. Um, and uh, my former PhD student's uh, book, his, his name is Yu Suzuki, Yu Suzuki has recently, recently published a book um, which deals quite in depth with the 1880s and, and uh, discounts this idea that there is much of a, an interest in either country in alliance, um, certainly prior to the Sino-Japanese War. But I would argue even the Sino-Japanese War itself doesn't really make 
a huge lot of difference in and of itself. Um, it may be tempting to look back from 1902 and say that the alliance is inevitable um, once Japan has emerged as the most important military power within the region. Um, but I really don't think, as I say, that it's as simple as that. And it's important to understand that Japan's victory led to a number of competing interpretations in the short term, both positive and negative. Um, and it's worth just looking here at the events of the triple intervention to understand the degree to which Japan, um, Britain is still ambivalent. Um, you may know that uh, at the end of the Sino-Japanese War in April 1895, China and Japan signed the Treaty of Shimonoseki um, and that then uh, Russia, Germany and France come in and force Japan to give up some of the fruits of its victory. Um, and Britain does not join the triple intervention. And so it might be possible to read back and say, ah, there we are. There is a sign that Britain is already more sympathetic um, to the Japanese. This is a pro-Japanese act. Well, it's not really. Um, the British non-involvement in the triple intervention should be read in line with the Rosebery government's reading of the British national interest and very importantly, the state of British domestic politics. This is quite a weak government. Stepping in to do anything in East Asia in military terms would not go down well with some in liberal quarters. And it's hardly surprising that Rosebery um, opted for non-intervention. It's also worth noting in the triple intervention that um, Japan said, well, if you're not going to help Russia, Germany and France, will you help us? To which the British reply distinctly was no, we're not. Um, it's also worth noting that in retrospect, many conservatives were actually critical of Rosebery's neutrality in 1895. They believed that uh, in fact, Britain should have backed the triple intervention powers um, and that this would have held up Britain's authority um, in China. So we can't look at the triple intervention really and see this as any great sign that there is likely to be um, or has already been a, a, a breakthrough in Anglo-Japanese relations. It's also worth thinking about how Britain's reflected on Japan's victory. What had Japan done? It had beaten China. Well, couldn't anyone beat China? Um, China's recent military history hardly suggested that it was an invincible force. So it may be that Japan has a good army for Asia, but what if it were to come up against a European force instead? Is it not likely that Japan would find that uh, too strong an enemy to take on? Some critics also note that Japan had quite clearly been the aggressor in this war. It had brought an unwelcome conflict into East Asia, which had disturbed British trade. And in the aftermath of the war, Britain's interests um, in China suffered at the hands of Russia um, and uh, France and indeed Germany. Um, and it's Japan that have created this situation. So really, we don't actually have anything to thank the Japanese for. So Japan being seen as a rather immature uh, power on the world scene, uh, creating instability where it was not welcome. But there is, of course, an even worse interpretation than that, which is the yellow peril. The Yellow Peril existed before 1894, but the writings of uh, Russian and uh, French commentators are largely dealing pre-1894 with the phenomenon being concerned with 
the, the potential threat of Chinese migration. The Yellow Peril changes with Japan's victory and comes to be focused in on Japan itself. And the interpretation that's developed is that Japan is a dangerous hybrid, a hybrid which mixes Western knowledge and Asian sentiment. So in other words, all the advantages of modernization plus what is seen by some as a tendency to barbarism and cruelty. And it's worth noting that a lot of the emphasis here fixes on a particular event, not a terribly well-known event now, but one of interest at the time, which is in November 1894, the Imperial Japanese Army seized, the, um, seized Port Arthur in southern Manchuria, and there was a massacre of Chinese prisoners. And critics of Japan seized upon this event and said, well, this reveals actually Japan's true nature, that it may be, at least on the surface, portraying itself as modern and, and European in its sentiments, but the reality is that it is still Asian. Um, and certainly this negative interpretation of the war does seem to hold some sway in the immediate years, immediate months after the Sino-Japanese War. We can see the Rosebery government falls in the late summer of 1895. A new conservative administration comes in, led by Lord Salisbury. Um, and he really has no great respect um, for Japan and wrote to Britain's uh, diplomatic representative in Tokyo in October 1895, quote, my impression is that uh, our strategic military interest in Japan can easily be overestimated. So there's no great sense of a move towards Japan after the end of the war. However, there is the beginning under the surface of ice, what I call a move from respect to admiration. And this appears in a number of different areas. First of all, I was very interested to see at the Wellcome uh, Institute in London, they hold the papers of the Royal Army Medical Corps. Uh, the RAMC sent a observer to watch the Japanese Army um, medical units in operation during the Sino-Japanese War. And he wrote, reports back um, to London. And the observer's report is full of praise for the way in which Japan's medical teams operated on the battlefield. Um, this is also taken up in the media. Um, the British Medical Journal in 1896 um, writes that the Japanese had acted, quote, with a thoroughness and foresight that might teach um, a, a needed lesson to many a Western nation. There is also interest at the same time, not just in um, Japanese medicine in day-to-day -day practice, but also the advances that uh, Japan is making in medical research, in particular, the work of uh, Kita Sato um, into um, the origins of diseases, the identification of the basilisk that leads to the, 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 uh, the plague. Um, the other area of great interest where Japan is not just involved in science, but is um, in quite a forward position, obviously, is seismology. Um, the work of um, uh, Milne uh, leading to the creation of a number of uh, prominent Japanese scientists of seismology. And it's worth noting in this context that in 1896, Japan was the only non-Western state invited to contribute to the Royal Society's International College, college Catalogue of Scientific Knowledge. And I found that to be an interesting recognition of Japan being um, operating at really the very heart of modernity. 
Um, and it's interesting to see its work being respected um, in that field. Another important area is Japan and how it is interpreted by the city of London. Um, and there is a growing interest within the city post Sino-Japanese war um, in Japan. Part of this um, is to do with appreciation of the way in which Japan handled the uh, money coming in from the Chinese indemnity from the war. And this being linked to Japan's move um, in 1897 to adopt the gold standard. It's also worth noting in 1897 and 1899, Japan was able to raise money on the London market. Uh, interestingly, the interest rate for the 1897 loan was 5%, not prohibitive. What does that say? It says that there's a degree of confidence. Loaning money to Japan is not a, a risky uh, investment. It's not, it's not a, a dangerous one. You will um, be, uh, receive the interest on your account. Your money is safe. We can also see in 1898, um, there are papers um, in the archive of Barings Bank showing its interest in the future expansion of the Japanese um, railway system. And Barings are very keen um, to get in at ground level and begin to provide money in that area. All of these things suggesting a, a sense of respectability of Japan, uh, a degree of trust. Um, we also have, um, drawing on the point I made about the Sino-Japanese War, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the Anglo-Japanese Commercial Treaty of 1894, the idea of Japan as a market um, as I note here, British exports to Japan doubled in value um, over the 1890s, so up to 9.8 million um, by 1900. And moreover, the nature of those exports changing, um, a much greater market developing um, for machinery, for capital goods, rather than simply textiles. Um, and there are a number of books uh, at this time, which are calling for Britons to take advantage of this market that's emerging. And I simply quote here um, the one from uh, Charles Wakefield from 1896. Um, but there's one aspect of um, the British exports, which I find particularly interesting. Um, and that is British arms exports. Um, as the bottom of the slide says, by 1900, ships accounted um, for almost 2.6 million of this 9.8 million um, that Britain was exporting to Japan um, in 1900. It's a huge sum. What is this about? This is um, a part of the reaction within Japan to the triple intervention. The triple intervention had revealed to Japan the urgent need to expand its navy so that it could never be coerced in the same way again by the European great powers. The obvious thing that Japan needed to do was to develop its own shipbuilding industry, but that takes time. Um, and in the interim, what you can see is Japan reaching out to arms firms around the world, but very particularly arms firms in Britain notably Armstrong's, Vickers and um, Thames Ironworks, so that you're seeing um, the, uh, um, the negotiation of, new, of contracts for shipping going on and on. And indeed, Armstrong's in 1896, um, its operating manager actually goes out to Japan for negotiations with the Japanese naval authorities. So again, a sense in which Japan is a, a growing and a modern power with which Britain um, ought to be in business. Um, we also have um, a continuing interest in Japanese culture. So still feeding 
um, that side of the interest. Uh, in particular, it's, it's gardening is the trend of the 1890s. Um, Jos uh, Josiah Conder's book uh, coming out in 1893, but also better books being written on Japan, books written with greater expertise and a more fluent prose, Things Japanese by Basil Hall Chamberlain in 1890, and then the, the works of Lifcardio Hearn, which really do um, win a, a lot of interest um, in Britain, the United States and elsewhere, partly because Hearn is such a fantastic prose writer. Um, Japan becomes in a way more accessible um, through this uh, translator of its culture. So by 1898, when there's a partition, partial partition going on in China, there is a greater interest even than in 1895 in Japan. There are a number of politicians and commentators saying if Britain is going to balance the other European great powers, it should turn to Japan. And this includes conservative figures like Joseph Chamberlain, George Curzon, George Goshen, and uh, the both MP and uh, Admiral um, Lord Charles Beresford. However, um, I'm going backwards. Um, there's also still 1898, 1899, there are still some countervailing forces. Um, there's a book called Under the Dragon Flag that comes out. Um, this is a man, a British man who say, served with the Chinese Navy um, during the Sino-Japanese War. And he wrote, wrote a, an eyewitness account of the Port Arthur massacre. So bringing that back um, into uh, the public domain. And there's this, this quotation that I found from a member of the China, of the China Association in 1898, who said that uh, he could not, quote, regard without hesitation the prospect of an alliance with Japan against Russia and Germany. It was not a natural alliance. It might be popular at the moment, but he mistrusted the race. and We could not, sure, could not be sure how it might end. In a sense, still a lingering suspicion images of the yellow peril, something else needed to change before an alliance became a practical policy for the government to espouse. And the argument I make in the book is this event was the Boxer War of 1900. Um, the war is important because once again, it demonstrates Japan's um, ability to work in a modern, well-organized, well-administered manner. But it's also important because it is a war where Japan sides with the West against Chinese xenophobia. By doing that, it puts itself uh, it takes itself out of the yellow peril equation in a way. It downgrades the idea that it should be treated with suspicion because of its Asian identity. Um, and this is a fact that it, it's mentioned in the orthodox history by Professor Nish and others, the Boxer War made a difference. I went into the sources to try and tease out more what this was about. And it is notable the degree to which both British officers and journalists developed a sense of affinity um, with their Japanese counterparts during this campaign. Um, this, as I argue, is the moment in which a sense of trust develops, a sense that Britain could engage in alliance with Japan and trust Japan to live up to its obligations. Um, I don't want to deal um, with the alliance uh, in my presentation, the negotiations. I simply just want to emphasize the background that as the alliance talks begin late summer of 1901, you still have the military and naval commanders serving in China 
talking of their respect for their Japanese counterparts. Um, there are book length accounts of the boxer campaign appearing in print in 1901. In one of them, the journalist George Lynch referred to the Japanese army as probably the best infantry in the world. Um, so there is an idea that the uh, alliance is now a, uh, a conceivable, a practical option for um, the British government to adopt. Um, and we can see this lastly, when we look at the alliance itself and the public response. I, one where, area where I would say I slightly disagree with Professor Nish is I, I think there is, there is more opposition in Britain than he takes account of um, to the alliance. Um, I think it's a bit broader than he and others uh, like David Steeds have made out. Uh, it wasn't uncontroversial. Um, it was attacked. It is true to say that it's a minority who are attacking it. Um, and that the majority are supportive. But what I would take from that is really that without the, the progress in science and technology, the admiration of culture in the 1890s, and then Japan's accomplishments in the boxer crisis, I don't think that majority would have existed. Um, so let us put it in those terms. Um, to conclude, what would I like to take away from this? Um, the point I really want to make in the book is that there is a danger in taking modern conceptions of race and race as a, a, as a dividing force and simply transposing that back to the 19th century and assuming that it works for everybody. Um, I think it is important as a number of historians um, linked to Peter Mandler in the University of Cambridge, um, Duncan Bell amongst them, um, and even the work of uh, Chika uh, Tonooka, who was due to give a talk today, the two articles that she's produced. Um, there's a sense in which we need to understand Britain's interpretation of Japan uh, against a civilizational paradigm rather than simply just a racial one. Um, and that civilization and mapping the degree to which Britain acknowledges there is a, acknowledges Japan as a civilization and then acknowledges Japan's move to uh, adapt itself to Western civilization. I think that helps to explain how we get to the alliance. So seeing the new methodologies of cultural history only in Saidian racial uh, collision terms, I think is doing an injustice um, to what is actually a much more complicated process. And I will leave it there because I'm feeling a bit tired. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Best, for a fascinating talk. A uh, great survey of decades of interactions and mutual perceptions. Um, I'm sure there are questions. I can see some questions in the q and I myself have a question or two, but I will uh, try and put forward the questions asked by the audience first. Okay. I will stop and... my share just a second. Okay. There we are. Yes. Okay, great. and. Uh, I will ask these questions with your permission, not in the order that they come in, but in the order of their relevance, because there are some questions which lie outside of our okay. period today. So um, Pratik Pankaj would like to know, during the early British Japanese encounters, do we also see descriptions of other common stereotypes like Oriental despotism, or is there an appreciation for political features uh, such as the Bakhan bureaucracy? Um, it's very interesting. I haven't seen anything caged in terms of Oriental despotism. 
Um, part of the problem they have in the period up until about 1866 is actually Japanese politics is so complicated that they don't really understand what's going on anyway. Um, in particular, they don't understand who holds sovereignty in the country. Um, as you can imagine, you know, they, they present, in 1858, they bring a steamship called the Emperor, which is designed to be handed to the sovereign of Japan. Well, guess who they, they give it to? They give it to the Shogun. Um, they're not quite sure who the emperor is. Um, but um, yes, I, I, I can't say there's anything in terms of oriental despotism, certainly not as something as clear, I would say, as the way in which George Curzon in 1894 describes Korea. Um, if you want an example of a description of oriental despotism, Curzon on Korea in his Problems of the Far East um, is as clear as you can get. But I, I don't get oriental despotism, I have to say. Um, I think there is, there is the beginning of a martial races discussion. Um, but it's even when the martial races discussion hasn't really achieved full fruition um, in India at this point, but a sort of discussion of the Japanese as uh, naturally good at the military arts, which is which is interesting. Well, that's then contrasted with the Chinese who are seen as dreadful. OK, the next question is by Jonathan Root, who is asking if any relationships, any of the bilateral relationships, were soured by Japan's invasion of China, which Britain also had interests in. There are some elements always in the British treaty ports in China who are not enamored of the Japanese. Um, part of this comes through a different area of interaction, there's always been a suspicion of Japan in business terms. The idea of the Japanese as, as cheating in business. Um, this began in the Japanese treaty ports and soon, like a disease, spreads to the Chinese treaty ports as well. I also think in the Chinese treaty ports, you can see Britons being resentful of Japan, Japanese businessmen, demanding to be treated equally to Europeans by the Chinese. Um, and it's, this is notable in a number of diaries held by British naval officers on the China Association. And indeed, you can see this in some comments that I found from naval officers about the signing of the alliance in 1902. So there are resentments there. OK, thank you. Um, Bethany Meisner would like to know, did Japan's proficiency of English increase uh, or did the British have to learn Japan in order to do business with them? Um, it is, no, it's, it's largely, um, if there's business, you, you, you've obviously got the uh, introduction of compradors. Um, and this is one of the great problems for the commercial treaties. Uh, for the commercial, sorry, for the treaty ports. Uh, one of the reasons why Britain is determined, if it can, to move away from the treaty port system is these are seen as restricting trade because all trade has to be carried on through compradors who are able to work in English and Japanese. The English businessmen, very few of them, learn to be fluent in Japanese. And this um, is a problem. Obviously, though, Japan is also sending out individuals, firstly, to be educated in Western um, university institutions, um, and then using them afterwards as businessmen, as diplomats who are fluent in English. And there are a growing number of these operating um, in European countries um, and in the United States. Um, and it is interesting, the treaty port community in Japan don't like these people. Um, 
they they accuse the Japanese overseas of giving a misleading impression of what the Japanese are like, um, mainly because the, the Japanese overseas tend to be upper class, sophisticated, and thus create a sense of the Japanese um, to a Western audience as being highly civilized. And the treaty port community don't like that. They're not very nice, the treaty port community, I have to say. Uh, thank you. Quite a few questions, but yeah, um, I will try to go through them. So um, Aiton Oren would like to know, first, as, as for the yellow peril and the shift from fear of Chinese migration to fear of Japan, do you see this shift happening in individuals or is it more of an observation at the level of ideas? That's um, their first question. Right. And the second question is, to what extent do you think that increasing trust towards Japan post boxer war might be also a result of generational changes in British leadership? Okay, um, I wouldn't, you would need to do, I would need to do more work on the intellectuals on the yellow peril. It's actually quite difficult pre 1894 to see many Britons using yellow peril rhetoric against China. I guess the only one would be Pearson and Pearson unfortunately dies in 1894. So one doesn't know what he said, would have thought afterwards. Um, one would need perhaps to look at somebody like Field Marshal Wolsey um, and uh, to follow through his thinking. He did warn in 1890 of what might happen if China ever, ever got a modernized army. Um, but I'm not really aware of what his attitude was towards the alliance. Sometimes just people just don't say anything, which is unfortunate. Um, it would be worth looking through, but it would be more of an ex exercise in intellectual history. Um, the second thing, generational. Um, it's interesting to think about. I, I think there is a change. Um, I think it is important that you see the generation who had got to know Japan in the 1870s, maybe moving out of making policy themselves. Those who'd served, certainly in the treaty ports of the 1870s, there are a number of them who are quite critical of Japan and what they see as Japan's pretensions to modernity. Um, they see its reforms as frivolous, as surface only. And I think that interpretation is being changed in the 1890s. So I think, yes, you could talk about um, a generational change. There's a very interesting letter sent by F. Frederick Dickens to Ernest Sato, which deals with this from the perspective of the, of the 1900s. And Dickens himself began as a critic of Japan in the 1870s, um, but as a, as a very intelligent man, reflecting on that and changing his impression by the 1900s, saying, actually, I was wrong. Great, fascinating. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Simon Pauli. Uh, you mentioned that the interest rate on Japan's capital raising in London was yeah. 5%. Without being too technical, it would be interesting to know, A, whether this bond issue was fully covered or oversubscribed, and B, what the eventual yield on this issue was. Um, I suspect that the 5% rate might have been just a coupon and consequently not the true borrowing cost. Incidentally, I used to work for bearings, by the way. Oh, right. Well, it, it all very technical. I know that... 1897, I believe it's oversubscribed, if I re recall correctly. Um, I'm not a financial historian, but I thought this was so important that I had to put it into the book. So, you know, apologies in the book if I've misinterpreted anything that I've said. Um, the 1897 loan is considered to be, at the time, a success. 1899 isn't, 89, 1899 is undersubscribed, but it's undersubscribed for a reason. It comes out just as the Boer War is starting. 
Um, so any money that's that's uh, being raised is going towards um, Boer War expenditure and supporting the British government um, rather than the the Japan loan of 1899. Um, more important though is if, if one follows this story through um, is um, the loan that is that Japan floats in London on 1902 which is a complete success um, and also uh, just keeping an eye on the degree to which Lord Revelstoke of Bearings um, keeps on pressing on this issue of loaning money to Japanese railway development. How can he get security on his loans um, on this is a, is a continual obsession of his until 1906 when the Japanese government nationalizes the railway system. But it, it's, it's a fascinating story. It is. It would be interesting also to know how that interest changed as Japan took on Russia later on. But yeah, maybe I'll... The in I'll interest leave. rates there are interesting. They begin high. They get a bit lower towards the end of the war. Um, but yeah, the amount of money that Japanese, Japan is borrowing um, is just astounding. And you, when, when you get people saying... You know, why doesn't Japan take advantage of the Russia-Japanese war and expand further afterwards? It's like they're broke, for God's sake. Um, that's a fascinating period. It is. It is. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, the next question is from Hamish Williams. What do you make of Britain's relationship with the United States during this period? Some might see them as unofficial members of the Anglo-Japanese alliance from the very onset, and parallels can argue, arguably be drawn between both US and Japanese economic growth in the late 19th century, as well as their increasingly close relationship with Japan. It's just interesting that Britain allied herself with Japan and not her Atlantic sister, as it were. Yes, well, it can't, because obviously the American constitution prevents such things at this point. Um, the president is not able to do this without Senate approval. The Senate's never going to approve it. Um, so there's no way in which you can actually get um, the United States to be a member of an alliance system. But certainly there is, and there is discussion between Britons and Americans. I know in 1905, where they're sort of saying, well, yeah, the Americans are almost behind the scenes in this alliance. And of course, the other thing to say about that would be in 1904-1905 that um, the city of London, in order to go ahead with the loans to Japan, is very keen to get the Americans in. Um, it's a way of making sure that Russia won't get too angry with Britain for this money from private institutions in the city going to Japan is getting private institutions in New York um, to do the same thing. So these loans are offered both on Wall Street and on the city of London. Um, so yeah, there is, there is a close relationship developing, but then of course the irony is 1906 begins to see America and Japan growing more suspicious of each other and creating problems for the Alliance. Thank you. I hope we haven't tired you too much. There are two more questions. No, that's fine. Um, so the next one is I, by Ivan Triola. Uh, thank you for your talk. I understand the title of the book starts with the words British engagement, therefore suggesting a focus on the British side. Yes. However, if we're talking about the Alliance and about the relationship between two cultures and two nation states, I have noticed a lack of engagement with Japanese language sources, at least during the talk, which could reveal more about the Japanese perspective. I was wondering if that is the case, and if so, if there's any particular reason for that. Um, the reason is, if, if I had better Japanese, um, I would have written it on both sides. Um, this book took me 18 years of research, more or less. If I'd have decided to do the Japanese side, let's say 36 years of research, I'd have been dead. Um, so um, I decided to write something on something that I knew best. Um, I've always felt actually engaging with my Japanese colleagues that if I do anything of value, it's interpreting my own country rather than misrepresenting theirs. 
Um, I don't I don't feel confident that I would be representing it as well, obviously as well as they could, but as well as some of my peers, obviously in the uh, outside of Japan itself. So I've done a book that I felt comfortable with. Um, I would have liked to engage more with some of the Japanese language historiography. As I said, I mean, there is there's material there that I find interesting in terms, some older material that I found interesting in terms of a sort of a naivety about this relationship, over -em emphasizing the degree of friendliness. Um, but uh, if you're interested in this, um, as I said, Yu Suzuki's book um, has just come out and Yu does use uh, British and Japanese sources. Um, I guess the other thing I would say in defense of my own book was knowing that I could only make a limited contribution in regard to Japan, I decided to make the approach I would take with Britain as broad as I possibly could. Um, to do something in a way that maybe a Japanese historian would find more difficult because of the time that it took to engage in this research. Uh, it took me, you know, this, as I say, this, this wasn't, this isn't just based as a, a summary based on secondary sources. Um, primary sources are absolutely vital to what I did. Great, thank you. Um, it's good to see our students asking questions. So uh, yes. a question from uh, Thomas Ralfall, who is uh, uh, one of our MA students, who is writing a dissertation on actually um, British perceptions of Japan during the US occupation period. Very interesting work. Um, so Tom is asking, brilliant seminar. My question is, was Japan ever seen as a copycat nation during the major reformation, especially with its adoption of Western styles of governance, or was it viewed as the right way of modernization? It's a good question. I think, you know, when, when I said in the 1870s, there's this ambivalence. I think that's, that's when Japan is being accused of copying and nothing more. It's all surface. It doesn't, it's, it's just an attempt to impress the West. It doesn't really have any integral va value of its own. Um, and then a conscious distinction to that, there's this moment in 1895, 96, when a British naval engineer goes to Japan and he says, God, they really understand this stuff. Now this is absolutely the, about as sophisticated technology as you could get at the time. And he's talking in admiration of Japanese naval engineers. So these aren't um, mere parvenus coming to this. They, they are really attempting to understand what it means to, uh, to design a, a modern battleship. I think also that's, that's true in regard to the medical research, the, you know, Kita Sato's, Kita Sato's work is being talked in the same breath as his mentor, um, who developed the Koch Institute in Berlin, which is still one of the main institutes of uh, work in, uh, in bacteria to the present day. Um, and the same, again, as I say, in seismology, even when Milne moves on from the University of Tokyo, his successors mean that Tokyo Todai still remains uh, a cutting edge institution in the, in the field of seismology. Great, thank you. Uh, second question from Simon Pauli. Um, it seems that this alliance was most expedient, expedient for both parties. It suited Britain to promote its arms sales to Japan mm -hmm. and to balance the powers in East Asia. And it suited Japan to develop its agenda to increase its inherent modernity as well as yeah as well as its role in the world yet there are so many parallels between the two nations two island-bound imperial powers yeah. which are hugely reliant on international trade yeah. and therefore on maritime power on balance from which of these two countries did the prime motivation for the alliance come from interesting um they're reaching a similar conclusion um the actual, if one's talking about the actual term, the precise terms of the alliance, they're Japanese. Um, the, the way in which the alliance is structured to create a limited war 
um, scenario is coming from the Japanese side. The British are talking about actually a much looser arrangement than that um, originally. Um, but even then, you know, there's something curious in the background, which is that a British newspaper writer had written about two, three years before that an alliance could look like this. In other words, the limited war scenario. I think the answer is the shape of the alliance is coming perhaps from Kato Takaki's conversations in London with those who are sympathetic to the cause of an alliance. And Kato is communicating that um, back to Tokyo. That's certainly, there are certain areas where I'm very curious to know more from the Japanese side, I have to say, not surprising. And that, that's one of them is, is just where that, the structure of the alliance comes from. Great. Uh, the number of questions we received uh, actually describes or reflects the huge interest in the topic, but also the breadth and importance of the research that you've presented to us today. So um, thank you very much for a fascinating talk on behalf of CJS and the UEA. And uh, I would also like to thank all, all of the attendees for your attention and also for your questions. I think, uh, I think uh, we've had a very good discussion and uh, we've had quite a few interesting questions and we can uh, call it a day here. And I would like to thank uh, once again, uh, Professor Best for his uh, wonderful presentation, which was very useful for us, especially hopefully for our students, but also for the wonderful answers that he gave to our questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, so this talk ends our uh, CJS webinars for this academic year. However, we will be back next academic year and we will announce a, a new program in the coming months. So please keep uh, having a like, keep checking the uh, our uh, website, Japan in Norwich but also the uh, social media handles uh, CJS UEA. I will also be posting on my own Twitter. So um, please continue coming to our seminars and webinars. And I hope to see you at one of those uh, very soon. Thank you very much. Okay. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ah.